My favorite championship overall was probably, gosh, I have so many. Not you, you do. Know, I say that you in the do. most humble way. Dude, I say that in the most humble you way. You said I have uh, rings. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm Cynthia Cooper, and I'm with my fam at Highlight Her. The Houston Comets were the first dynasty of the WNBA, and we have a lot of new fans, which is great. We love when new fans come, but when it comes to the Comets, what do you wish people remembered from that time? Well, then we were we were unique in that we won. We're the only professional team to win four championships in a row. Okay. But how we did it was so amazing because you know the first year we were without Cheryl Swoops for the majority of the season. The second year there was an influx of ABL players, and no one believed that we could repeat as champions. And we only had the best winning percentage of any professional team that year, and that was ninety percent. The third year we lost, um, we lost our point guard, Kim Parat, to cancer. Um, so it was three for 10. And then the, the fourth season, it was just, why not? You know, why not keep the dynasty and the legacy going and win four championships in a row? It was the first time it had ever been done. We had had different types of pressure every single season. We had a target on our back and we just gutted it out. And I thought that was unique to our franchise. One thing you are is consistent, okay? How you have been able to maintain consistency through those years? Well, I will tell you, my number one goal in any team that I've ever participated on was to win. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not happy just being a participant. Mm -hmm. I'm in it to win it. I'm trying to win championships. All of the individual accolades, I believe, come later. They come, you know, with winning. But for me, I was older, so I I started at 34. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, basketball is time sensitive. Mm -hmm. I need to get this going right now. And and so from that's I think that's why I was so consistent because I brought passion to every practice, to every game, every year, mm -hmm. and that helped me be consistent. I also added to my game because I didn't believe that I could be the same next year as I was the year before and still win a championship. So I continue to get better and better and better um, in, in order to, to show something different and win championships. You know, for me, I, I think my passion for the game, my love for the game and my desire to leave a winning legacy was really the difference that separated me from a lot of people. You know, I, I remember Coach Chancellor telling me, you know, asking me, why am I at training camp on the first day? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a veteran, I'm older. Why are you here the first day? You don't need to be here the first day. And I'm like, look, I need to be there the first day for, for one reason and one reason only. I need to show everybody that the right wing is taken. Oh, it's mine. Period. Period. The right wing is done. It's done. You, you, you can go over to the other wing, you can go to the post, you can go to the point guard position, but the right wing mm -hmm. has my name written all over. As a matter of fact, they tap, they put it on the floor. No, I'm just. Just kidding. I, I was, you know, it, it was just about really showing it, you know, showing up every day, bringing that passion, bringing that winning attitude, that work ethic, and then having everyone else hopefully measure up to it. Mm -hmm. You know, setting just setting the bar every practice, every game. You know, we look at it now. We see players in their 30s. We're like, we don't know how much longer they have. And you entered mid 30s and we're able to be that elite. And I, and I know you said, you know, work hard and you like passion, but what, what are the keys to staying elite too? Well, you know, when I played overseas in Italy, um, it, it, and by the way, your parlo italiano said, c'è qualcuno che vuole intervistarmi in italiano, possiamo, uh, oh, she, oh, oh, sorry. This is just weird. I was like. <laughs> just rolls into that sometimes. Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, we stand a cultured queen, okay? Bad. We stand a cultured queen. <laughs> it's like my bad. Um, so, no, you know, for me coming into, it was my dream to play in the WNBA. It was my dream to come back to America and play in front of American fans and my family and my friends who I had lost touch with playing in Italy for so long. So for me, I was on a mission. Mm -hmm. I, I'm talking about, you talk about in it to win it. I was next level in it to win it because I, I felt like I had so much to prove, so much to prove to people who hadn't seen me play in 10 years. And so when I came back, I went about my business to be ready in order to be at the top of my game for a league that I had only dreamed about playing in. And so, for you know, it cost me nothing. I was working out before practice, 
during practice, after practice, I would grab the rookies and work on my one-on-one -on -one game after practice. I'd have the strength and conditioning coach training me both with weights and sprints. And I did all of that before practice. I then practiced and 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 um and then grabbed the rookies and played one-on-one -on -one afterwards. And because for me, at the 35 minute mark, I want the ball in my hands and I want to have the fitness and the ability to knock down that clutch shot when we needed it. You said it was a dream of yours to go to the WNBA, but obviously the WNBA didn't always exist and there was a competing league at the time. What made you decide to go to the WNBA? So in every phase of my career up until when I went overseas, I had really been a role player. You know, I played at USC with the McGee twins and Cheryl, the great Cheryl Miller. Um, and then from there, and when you go to the national team, I came off the bench. I, I played with great stars, but I was always kind of a role player. Um, when I went overseas, I kind of came into my own and became the go-to player. And so when I got to the WNBA, I wanted to, one, prove that I could play basketball and that my game had transformed from when they had seen me before, and two, I just want to win. I, I, I wanted, I didn't go to the ABL because they didn't want me. I, I mm. called them like I called the WNBA. Mm -hmm. And a really funny story about the WNBA, I wanted to play in the WNBA and I put together, you know, all of these stats and some film and I, I put together this package ready to send to the WNBA from, from Italy. Um, just to let them know what I've been doing. And, and I called the head and I spoke to Renee Brown and I was like, you know, Renee, I really wanted to play. I want to play in the WNBA. Uh, you know, I have this package. I'm going to FedEx to you guys so you guys can see my stats and some video. And she stopped me mid-sentence and was like, Cynthia Cooper from Italy? I said, yeah, you know, I really want to play in the WNBA. She was like, oh, girl, we, we couldn't find We already your want you. We don't know your address. What do we send a contract? Like, you're, you're in a part of our top eight. And I'm over there. <laughs> Oh yeah, you can send the, you know, you can send it to you. I was so excited to have that opportunity. Um, you know, so for me, I wanted to leave a legacy. I wanted to mm. prove that I could play basketball in America on this level, um, on, on, on an elite level. And so, and that I was no longer a role player, but that I was a go-to player. What was your favorite championship to win? I know it's kind of a hard question because you know, they all hold a special place, but what was your favorite championship overall? So my favorite championship overall was probably, gosh, I have so many. Not you, you do. Know, I say that you in the most humble way, dude. I say that in the most humble you way. You said I have uh, rings. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna choose one, mm -hmm. and um, that was my Olympic gold medal in 1988. Period. Because it, it was on my mother's birthday. Mm -hmm. Because the uh, Olympic Committee had a special program where they allow you know one person to come over. Um, from your family and my mom was in Seoul, Korea when we won that gold medal and I was able to, you know, present it to her on her birthday. So that was special to me. Um, but when you look at the WNBA, man, I would probably say three for 10. You know, when we had, when we had the, the tragedy of losing Kim in August, a couple of days before the playoffs started, and we were able to, you know, come together and rally around each other and still win that championship. I thought that was, uh, you know, that really showed the character of, of that team um, that year. Um, and then, you know, at USC, I mean, mm -hmm. who could who could imagine playing with three great players? I mean, everyone was great, but we, with the McGee twins and, and Cheryl Miller, I mean, I, I, I thought I was great when I got to college. You know, I thought I was I was it. I had averaged 30 points my senior year. You know, I'm ready to go. Shoot, when I saw Cheryl Miller practice, I was like, you got work to do. Uh -huh. Like you got to get your game right. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, it, it was just great winning back-to-back -back championships at USC. They, they really opened the window of the world um, to me. How tough was it? To, to lose a teammate like that and still have to push on her, even witness her getting sick like that. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was tragic. Like it was really sad. And, you know, up until that point, I'd had tragedy in my life, but you know, basketball, I used basketball to kind of work my way out of it and really stay focused on positive things. Um, when Kim passed, I, I think we were all just heartbroken and really didn't see the significance of playing another basketball game because it just was too much. It was too hurtful. It impacted us in, in such a um, an incredible way. And so, 
you know, but for me throughout my entire career, um, I've always tried to tame, change negative situations into positive situations. And earlier that year, I lost my mom. So I lost my mom in February, and then I lost, we, we lost Kim in, in August, August 19th. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I was on fumes. You know, I was just emotionally, um, just, just, it was tragic for me. So I, I just was like, you know what? We got these games, you know, my mom would be mad, Kim would be furious mm -hmm. if we just allowed these excuses to not allow us to win a championship. So I really tried to give my team, us, a reason, a reason to be champions instead of an excuse to underachieve. And I wanted to pay to a tribute to two people who were incredibly special in my life. Um, and so three for 10 was, was really about showing the world how special Kim Peral was. Mm -hmm. So what are some ways that you were able to, you know, those are two really traumatic events before the season or during yeah. and before the season. How are you coping when, when you're, you know, had the pressure to maintain this dynasty? Cause at that point, I mean, nobody was touched, like, let's be honest, nobody was touching y'all. So dealing with that pressure, dealing with the trauma that you had, dealing with the, you know, different personalities on the team, different, different things within the league, you getting older, how are you able to maintain your self care? Well, great news is I am singularly focused. Mm. So whatever I'm doing, that's where I am. I'm not dividing my attention or my energy. I was focused on the basketball game when it was time to focus on basketball. I was focused on grieving for both my mother and Kim when it was time to grieve. Um, but I will tell you at the end of that season, you know, no one really knows this. I, I was supposed to go from that championship game, maybe a couple of days later, I was supposed to go to the USA um, team to uh, work out and, you know, kind of try out for that team that invited me out. Um, I went to Hawaii alone, mm -hmm. and I I um, and I just I had to recover. I I could not, you know. So many people talk about how did you get through those days, and I will tell you, there were some times I couldn't get out of bed. There were some times I had to crawl before I walked. I I had to grieve, and I needed time. And I remember them calling my my agent at the time and. It was like, hey, she needs to get out here to Colorado Springs. And I was like, they were like, if she don't get out here, you know, we're gonna pick an alternate. And I was like, yeah, I need to pick an alternate because mm -hmm. I'm not ready. I know myself and I knew I wasn't ready to go from the WBA championship straight to USA basketball. So I took the time I needed to heal my heart because mm -hmm. it had been broken. I'm so glad that you took that time for you because we don't we don't know if like, you know, a lot of times we think that, oh, we're at the highest point of our career, so we can't step away. So kudos to you for going to Hawaii, but we're going to spin this a little bit more fun. I need to know, since since, since you're telling me the secrets of um, what happened at your Hawaii trips and things, in the comments, <laughs> give me some fun times that maybe we don't know about. The best time I had was watching um, the competition mm -hmm. from Coach Chancellor and all of the players when they had to play spades or they played dominoes and just really listening to the banter. And I remember one player, I won't name her, but one player messed around and beat Coach Chancellor in spades. Mm -hmm. And needless to say, she was cut the next practice. We didn't see her. I'm just saying, Coach Chancellor took spades very, very seriously. Don't play with him. No, it was know me. the boundaries, y'all. Know the boundaries. Don't be too close in spades. Man, come on, man. You, you gotta teach me how to play. <laughs> See, that's the problem with everybody. Everybody wants to talk about you when you don't know how to play spades, but nobody wants to teach you how to play spades. That's so, right. I got you though. <laughs> got me. Trust me with it. Just help me. Help me out. Um, <laughs> what does a dynasty like you guys mean for women's basketball or women's sports in general? Because you guys are the only um, dynasty of that sort. I think opportunity, it means opportunity. It means open doors. You know, every time I went out on the court and I was warming up for a game, you know, I always took into account what I was playing for. Mm -hmm. And I was playing for the little kid who dreams of being a professional basketball player, who 
who, who dreamt of, of, of playing professionally and being a star, who looked at us, looked up to us as role models and wanted to be like us. And so I wanted to show them what a professional athlete in America should be like, how the, the work ethic they should have, the goals they should set for themselves. And once you achieve those, go set new ones for yourself because there is no limit to greatness when that's what you want. When you want greatness, you gotta go get it. Right. It doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen by magic. It happens when you're willing to put in the hard work and you're willing to sacrifice in order to leave a legacy. Yes, ma'am. Speaking of legacies, we have this one. Um, the raise the roof thing. Can't can't let the can't let the interview go by without talking about it. What made you start it? Why do you think the fans loved it so much? And do people still walk up to you and do it? Yes, people still walk up to me and raise the roof. So Kim Parrot started it. And I saw her do it. Like she made a bucket and she went, mm. I was like, oh, that's cool. Oh, next next bucket is going down. So <laughs> I, I hit a bucket. I'm raising the roof. I'm like, I don't hear you. And from then on, you know, that was my thing, right? It was my thing to kind of raise the roof off the arena, to, okay. to make enough noise to raise the roof off the arena. So for me, um, you know, it, it started with Kim, but it ended with um, us really getting fan interaction mm -hmm. and bringing the fans into everything that we were doing out there on the court to really let them live it, you know, live the live the experience that they're seeing on that court. Yes, ma'am. And then I remember Candace telling me about like, you inspiring her through that Raise the Roof. And so I want to know your perception on like the next generation and the next generation. What's the difference between the league's inception and what it is now? I think the, the subtle change has made a big difference for the WNBA. When you look at players, when I when, when I played in the WNBA, you know, there were some really talented players, you know, spread across the league. But when you go and look at the WNBA now, you can see that 10 years ago, players were dreaming of playing professional basketball. So they started putting in that early skill work. They started the mentality of a winner. They started developing that mentality of a winner. And so now you see players more talented and more confident getting um, starting in the WNBA and um, you know, the talent in the WNBA, overall talent in the WNBA is absolutely off the charts. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you do see stars here and there, but right now at any given, on any given day, any given day, game, you will see great players just showcasing their talent and stepping up to the challenge. Yes, and speaking of great players, you have just been named to the W25, top 25 players in the entire history of the WNBA. First of all, how'd it feel? I mean, I know this isn't your first go round because you know you've been, you've been in 10, 15, 20, whatever, but how did it feel? And also, do you feel like anybody was slighted off that list? I'm gonna get spicy. Oh, um, slighted? I don't know. I don't know if anyone was was slighted. I, I um, you know, I felt honored because to be honest, I'm old. And I didn't know this younger generation would remember kind of the, the you know, outset or the infancy of the, the WNBA and the WN and, and where we came from in order to get to where we are. So I didn't know that they would pay tribute to that necessarily. I guess it helps to win four championships in a row. It does. And nobody else has done it. Period. So, um, you know, so that that was great to see. It was, it's just always great to see how the fans um, are really into the legacy and the history of the WNBA, even with the current, you know, current players showcasing their talent every night. And you wrote an article saying, I want my damn respect. Yeah. So that's absolutely like give you all your flowers. But what do you want people to know about your legacy in particular that they should take with them? that, you know, I love basketball and I would have been playing in the WNBA for free if they had allowed, if they didn't pay me, I would still play for free. That's how much I love basketball. And the mo most, you know, I think the most important thing for me was to leave a legacy and to lay the foundation for the next generation. And I challenge every player in the WNBA to think the same, 
to bring their A game when they step out on that court, to bring their A game when they're in these different meetings or when they're at their, their, their they have you know fans out there interacting with fans. Bring your A game. Show people that we really appreciate the W and that we appreciate their fan support, and so that you can then leave that next level legacy for the next generation. Period. Um, since you left that legacy, though, I need to know. The world needs to know. What is Coop doing now? Well, I'm doing a lot. You know, I do some some television, some consulting um, with some television series. I do. I coach at Texas Southern University. Um, shout out to to the Tigers, Lady Tigers in the building. Um, so I do a lot of, of uh, community stuff. You know, obviously with breast cancer, and um, I just want. Um, to, to pass the torch. You know, for me, you don't have to be great in basketball. I want you to be great at something though. Mm -hmm. Don't settle for less. Don't just be a participant, be a winner. And that's in whatever you do next, you know? So that's what I try to teach my players, um, challenge my coaching staff. And so I coach right now, do, you know, public events. And so I just, I'm, li I'm living the dream. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely living the dream. Period. And fill in the blank for me. This is the last thing. Cynthia Cooper is? An uh, assistant coach in the NBA. Period. Okay. 